Thank you so much for, for having me. I know I can actually say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where people are, are tuning in from. So, so thank you so much for, for taking this time to, to spend with us as we talk about resiliency, as we talk about disruption. And um, disruption is around us all the time. Um, I'm in the middle of a disruption right now because if you've been on any of our sessions, um, you normally don't get to see my whole office because of the way our cameras uh, are set up, except our internet is down um, neighborhood wide. So here I am on a completely different device and uh, we're still able to connect. And, that's, and for me, that's what makes resiliency ex exciting. It's we have one plan going and then life happens and it forces us to create a new plan. And if there's a group that is that exemplifies that, it would be you. Uh, you are constantly shifting and making adjustments to your plans um, as you deal with different circumstances in your life. And, and so for me, that's an exciting thing when I get to talk to people about resiliency and, and they live it out every single day. Um, resiliency is one of those things that we have to, we really have to be in the middle of in order for us to appreciate, in order for us to gain value from it. We, we often, often people don't go through enough things in order for them to hit the points of resiliency. And so today that's what we get to talk about. And, and I'm going to get a little bit more nerdy today because we'll talk a little bit about the research. I won't go too, too deep into the research, but the reason I wanted to study resiliency is I noticed that stress became a huge huge issue for a lot of people. Now, now that we're in COVID times, stress is the norm, unfortunately. But I remember in undergrad, um, learning the difference between eustress and distress. That was mind blowing for me because in the normal vocabulary, you hear about stress all the time and people use the word stress, I'm stressed. And stress started to gain this connotation for negativity that, all stress is bad, that all stress is disruptive, that all stress hurts us. And so people stay away from stress. And if there's a chance that something will be stressful, they would run away from it. But some of the most amazing things that happen in our lives are, they happen at that crossroad between our you know, something being extremely stressful and also something being manageable. And so the big difference between you stress and distress Eustress is the natural stress that a human body experiences, but also a human mind, a human soul, a human spirit that we endure to the point that we can handle it. So if you're sitting down right now, you're enduring some measure of stress, whether it's in your rear, whether it's in your lower back, whether it's in your shoulders, you, you, there's, a, there's an amount of stress on your body occurring right now. If I were to ask you to stay in that same position for three straight days and not move, that stress would move from eustress, which is comfortable stress, to distress, which is completely uncomfortable and often dangerous stress. So we have to have that distinction between eustress and distress. And when we understand that difference, it helps us really connect to the value of stress. And so in my research, that's what I wanted to figure out is what, what's the real value for, for stress? In what ways can stress actually help us. Not all stress is bad, but also not all stress is good. And so I wanted to focus on the areas where, where stress was important. And, and really for me, this whole thing started around the workplace. So we'll start from the workplace and bring, bring it into your world. And when I was thinking about the workplace, for a lot of people, work itself, it's the third most common source of stress. People get really stressed about work. They really struggle with expectations. And in the context of COVID right now, it's a big stressor for a lot of people because they want to meet their employer's uh, expectations, assuming they're actually employed. But at the same time, they want to be a good parent and they want to be a good spouse or a good grandparent and all these other things that they want to do all at the same time. And they want to meet people exactly where they are, which is a good thing. Unfortunately, there's only so much time in every single day, and there's only so much that we can do at any given point. And so my definition of stress, at least that came from my research, is stress occurs when we feel as if we cannot meet expectations. And probably the best version that I've heard in a commercial setting 
is we get stressed when we feel, not other people feel, but when we feel that we've been weighed and we've, we've been found wanting, right? We've been weighed, we've been measured, and we've been found wanting. That's our concern, our fear. And when we feel that way, it brings a great deal of stress on us. Now, I imagine that every single one of us on this call has felt that at some point, that we've been weighed, we've been measured, and we've been found wanting. Uh, and it could be in any area of our lives, either us as spouses, as friends, as neighbors, as parents and grandparents, as citizens of the world. We, we struggle with that. For the workplace, that's the biggest challenge is folks want to do as much as they can to meet the expectations of those that they report to, of those that they care for, whether it's healthcare professionals and so on. Obviously, over the last 15 months or so, the healthcare profession has really, really struggled, especially hospitals trying to take care of people who are ill and trying to support them with a disease that is that was they only knew very little about it and now everybody has to get involved and support and strengthen one another that was a, those were very very stressful times so my big question in my personal world but also in my professional world is when we when we've endured stress what do we take away from it that's always my big question and so I never want to leave any stones unturned in the middle of stressful situations. So I want to ask myself, if I had to go through this very painful and difficult situation, if I had to go through this challenge, whatever that challenge might be, perhaps this was the challenge of being on lockdown for months and months and months, uh, the challenge of having to make a, a major decision around whether to get the vaccine or not to get it the decision for, I mean, there's so many decisions, all those things can be stressful. In the middle of all of that, is there a way for us to gain more than just a good decision has been made? Can we go through that stress and turn that stress into opportunity for growth? Can we turn that stress into an opportunity for us to improve and do what we do just a little bit better? Uh, is there a chance for that? Those are the questions that I ask around building resiliency because I don't want a disruptive moment to go wasted. And unfortunately for a lot of people, when they experience stress, they try everything that they can do to, to turn the situation away from, from stress. They want things to be not stressed or less stressed, which is healthy and a normal human response. However, not all stress is bad. So I want to look for opportunities in the middle of my stressful situations for growth, because I know that they're great opportunities for growth. And that's something that we have to do, you know, in the workplace, uh, the, the, the research is showing that on average, people who are extremely stressed, they're going to, they're going to have about 4.6, let's just say five days, uh, five, six days is what they will, five, five, sick days is what they will take every year compared to people who don't feel that they are stressed. So stress does have a physical impact on our bodies. Part of my conversation today, I wanted to be around sharing with you my research area, but also give you practical ways to manage stress better, but also practical ways to use stress for your growth and for your opportunities, because that's something that we all must do. Because if we don't, uh, stress just compounds, right? More and more stress just builds up more and more stress until our bodies fail whether it's our immune systems that can't take it anymore, whether it's our lower back that begins to hurt or our neck and so on. And all those things have been found that they are deleterious effects on the human body when we take on more stress than we need to. Uh, and when you think about it from a productivity perspective, the numbers are showing that every single year, companies are losing about $500 billion in productivity, all because of stress. So my idea around research was how can we turn that around? How can, we, how can we reduce those losses because people have built resiliency such that when stressful situations pop up, they have a better chance of thriving. They have a better chance of winning. And if I didn't mention it, that's my goal in life. I want to use behavioral science to help people thrive. I happen to do it mostly in the workplace because that's where I can meet multiple families and multiple people from different neighborhoods. And so that's why I focus primarily on the workplace. But how can we help people really thrive in stressful times? And that's a hard ask, right? Most of us here have probably experienced one or more losses of friends or people that we knew because of COVID. So that's stress enough. 
Um, I come from an international family. Um, there's nine of us. Uh, I'm here in the US. And so I guess I'll start from the top. Barbara is in London. Carol is in Belgium. Eugene was in India. Now he's back in Zambia. Um, Al uh, Alex has been all over the world. He's in Zambia. Uh, Fred lived in London, then moved to Thailand, and now he's in Zambia. Uh, Francis lives in South Africa. Victor is in Zambia, but was in Maastricht in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, Brian lives in Thailand. So we're all over the world. Fortunately, COVID didn't touch us as severely, but it did touch one of us you know, quite bad. My brother-in-law in London, well, he had a really bad situation with COVID. And he was, you know, he was in the hospital for, he was on the hospital for weeks actually, and in ICU for three weeks of that. Um, and so that was a difficult situation. And in the, even in the middle of all of that, how do we as a family, how do we as individuals find opportunities and ways to thrive despite what we experienced? That's my mission is in what ways can my brother-in-law, my two nieces, and uh, now two great nieces uh, from that side of the family, how do we help them find ways to make what they, ex what they just experienced a little bit more meaningful for them? So that in its meaningfulness, growth occurs. So that in that meaningfulness, um, the next time a different type of stressor shows up, they're a lot more prepared. Uh, they say that chance prepare, you know, you know, that chance favors the prepared. Uh, part of it is being prepared for the next disruption. And it doesn't have to be at the size of COVID. It could be a small disruption such as losing your internet service. Uh, most people think that we're going to do well if it's a big thing. But most of us don't realize that even with the small things that we have to deal with, and I call, you know, I say small things, right? Your internet went out. That's not as bad as having to deal with, I don't know, uh, a COVID restriction for a month or for six weeks or for two months or however long. But when we become really good at managing the small stressors, we're building up our resiliency muscle in order for us to handle the bigger ones. So I did not like what happened last year. I have yet to meet a person who was like, yes, I'm so excited that uh, COVID happened. Not a single person. All of us really struggled in one way or another. But the data is beginning to show that the people who found themselves thriving in spite of being in the middle of a pandemic are those people who have a different type of mindset. And that's what I want us to talk, to, talk about today as we think about different mindsets, because those mindsets make, make a huge, huge impact on the way we carry ourselves and the way we feel about ourselves. Um, you've probably been exposed to enough research about how thoughts impact our actions. And that middle part is how we think impacts how we feel and then how we feel impacts how we act. And so if we look at that connection, we know that our actions are tied very, very closely to our thoughts. And some of our thoughts, we actually use words to bring our thoughts out. So one of the key pieces is really narrative. Um, everyone has to really think about the narrative that they tell themselves and they tell other people. Some of us live, most of us live our narrative out even without words, right? The way we speak to people, the way we carry ourselves, the way we protect ourselves and protect others, that's part of our narrative, right? That's us living our narrative out. Others use words on top of living that narrative out. So when I was doing my research, I wanted to know what are the types of things that people tell themselves in the middle of stressful situations? What narratives do they carry in their minds? Uh, what do they say to people about the situation that they are in? So I'm sure, and as Kate mentioned, right, you listen to the news depending on, and it, and it doesn't matter which side of the news it is, right? Right, left, center, up, down, doesn't matter. One side will tell you that the earth is on fire that it's just, it's, it's over for you. Another side might tell you, oh my gosh, there's nothing for you to worry about. Everything is okay. And then there's people in the middle who are saying, I don't know whether things are on fire or things are this way, but I'm going to listen to both sides. This is what I'm discovering, right? There's all these different perspectives. What we most of us don't realize is there's a narrative that's flowing in each and every one of those. And we adopt those narratives. And so my natural position is as a scientist is to always hear what everybody has to say and then make a judgment based on facts. 
not somebody else's facts. Because again, that's the challenge with facts, right? Everybody has the right to their own opinion, but they don't have a right to their own facts because people create their own facts. And I'm sure you've heard every single fact out there created by different people about the vaccine or about created, you know, created about COVID itself or created about, there's just all these different things that people will say. And part of our process in being able to manage that level of stress is being very careful about the narratives that we adopt, because sometimes we do adopt narratives. You know, I come from a rich tradition of family members. You know, we've tracked down my family, uh, you know, at least on the on the on the on my dad's side, right? Multiple generations. I think we're six generations we've been able to look. I can tell when my when my grandfather moved from Angola and moved into Zambia. By the way, I'm originally from Zambia. I may not have mentioned that. But when they when he moved to Zambia and all that, we've looked at all that lineage. And that's been wonderful. Well, sometimes in our lineage and in our family, it's very easy for us to adopt certain narratives about who we are, even if we may not be that thing, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And so we have to be careful about the narratives that we generally adopt because those narratives are really going to drive what we do. And so one of the things that my research found is that for people to really thrive in the middle of stressful situations, number one is that they have to adopt a narrative that is positive. Rather than focus on the things that are broken, they focus on the things that are working. And so I am a positive psychologist. It does not mean that I don't see the brokenness in the world or the brokenness in others. It's that it's not the only thing I see, that there are multiple parts to every human being. All of us on this call today, here's one thing that we do know. There are parts of us that need a lot of improvement, but there are also parts of us that are absolutely amazing. If I could just spend 15 to 20 minutes with each and every one of you, there's an amazing story about your life amazing things that you have done and amazing ways in which you have touched other human beings. But at the same time, I'm sure there are parts of your story where you're like, yeah, I wasn't exactly really bright when I did this. I wasn't really smart when I said that. That's the human condition. And that's what I love about the human condition is that perfection is not a requirement. And it's great when you can be around people who don't feel the pressure to either be perceived as perfect or be perceived as, as needing to be perfect because we don't have to be. So that's one of the pieces when it comes to the narrative we tell about ourselves is there's absolutely no need for you to be perfect. And unfortunately, perfect is often defined by somebody else. So somebody might say, well, you can't do this, 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 or this, that makes you not perfect. Well, according to whose definition, right? I, the last time I visited with you, I mentioned how it was so impressive that you were making the decisions that you were making while you were fighting a harsh disease. And here you are making major ends, making major decisions, and you have a global alliance. And maybe you've never thought about it from that perspective. So this is my opportunity as the outsider to tell you, you have a global alliance of people. We have people who are supposedly smarter, sharper, have all their 10 fingers and 10 toes and so on, they don't have a global alliance, you do. And so sometimes what we need is to have, is to step out of our norm and see how, how, how unique we are, but also the amazing things that we do. And that's part of our narrative, right? I have no ambition to be a perfect person. So I don't even worry about it every day. I just, I, I, have, I have no ambitions for that. I think it's wasted energy. And I think it's, it, it actually distorts and sometimes destroys my narrative if I keep focusing on being perfect. All I want to do is to play my part and to be a resource to other people. If I can do that, then my world eventually gets better because we make the world better one thing at a time, right? You've heard the, you've heard the line that Rome wasn't built in a day, um, but it burned in one. Well, one of the things that people don't realize is that Rome was built one brick at a time. And that's what you're doing. One brick at a time, one conversation at a time, you are making your mark on each other. You are making a mark on the research around this particular disease. And you are living embodiments of the positivity that comes from having the right perspective. So your mindset is already there. So for me, that was, that was impressive to hear as people were sharing their stories 
through this uh, phenomenological study and they're like, and you could tell that the, the thing that came out of all of that, right, the cream that rose from those conversations was really around a very positive uh, narrative. The other part was a very self-reflective narrative. And I imagine you do the same thing. You, at least from the conversations that I've had with you in the past, you are very self-reflective. You, you look back at where you were and it doesn't have to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's where you were yesterday. How are you today compared to where you were yesterday? Or perhaps how are you this afternoon, this evening, this morning compared to the previous afternoon, evening, and morning? What strides have you taken? What strides have you made? Each and every one of those adds to the narrative of your life. And I have a bias, obviously, towards narrative because people ask me, well, what motivates you to do the things that you do? I always say, well, one day, my book is going to end. And when somebody's reading my book, whether it's through the stories that they tell about me when I pass or whatever it is, I want them to reach this juncture in my story and say, you know, Koji had the greatest opportunity to just sit down and cry, but he chose not to sit down and cry. He got up and kept moving. Well, what happened in this situation? Koji got knocked 15 times. Well, as you learn in Koji's story, you figured out that 15 clearly wasn't enough because he got up again a 16th time. And that's what we do every day in a very self-reflective narrative. We're constantly asking ourselves, what kind of story do I want to tell? Because right now is my opportunity to write that story. I have an opportunity right now. If I can write the story right now, this is how I want this narrative to flow. There are, a lot of op there are a lot of times in our narrative that we just can't tell a certain story, but right now, this is the story I could tell. And I will tell a story that is positive, a story that is self-reflective. I will tell a narrative that is focused on doing the right thing. Another piece was, it was, you know, the stories are very other-oriented, the narratives are other-oriented. So a good friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Beebe, he just retired from Texas State University. I'm going to go with probably the smartest, um, educator that I know. Um, he would disagree, but he doesn't have to agree with my opinion. But I think he's one of the smartest people I know. And he defined other orientation as, as considering the thoughts, the needs, and the motives of others before our own. And as an organization and as individuals, that's what you do. I got on the call about uh, 340 my time. So that was 20 minutes before we were set to start. And each of you was, were just talking to each other, checking in on each other. How are you guys doing based on COVID and so on? That's other orientation. Nobody forced you to do that. That's not a script that you picked up. That's naturally who you are. That's part of your narrative. It's very other oriented. And so I hope after we have this conversation and going forward on your hardest days, because you will have them and we all have them, you'll remember that you've got an amazing story to tell and you've been telling it well as you've been going anyway. You have focused on other people. You don't focus on what's going wrong in your life, even if things are going wrong. You don't focus on the negative stuff, even if negative stuff is going on. You focus on the positive. You focus on ways to encourage each other, to build each other up. And that naturally becomes your narrative. It becomes your story. But here's the coolest thing you get to help other people write their story. Um, I am a bird person. I don't know about you, but I love eagles. You can't see it right now, but I actually have two eagle things in front of me. Let me see if I can bring one into camera view and not break it. Ah, see that? I just, I love eagles. I am a sucker for eagles. So one of the things I love about eagles is it's, it's fairly lonely for them where they are, right up in the air, but they have a completely different vantage point. And that's what you do for each other is even as, as, as distant as you are from each other, you've used the platforms correctly in a way that you can see things that others can't see. You're giving each other different vantage points and you're supporting each other. When Kate was mentioning how she's in a place right now where she feels guilty for you know, that things are just going, you know, relatively well where she is, um, somebody, got on, somebody got on and said, no, you don't have to feel guilty. You don't. And that's exciting that you can be in an environment where you, you, 
you're not afraid to talk about the things that are going well in your life. Because unfortunately, when you're around a lot of people where things are going wrong, it becomes this festival of complaining. Let's, you know, let me top how bad things are. Let me tell you how bad things really are for me. And then the next person says the same thing and the next person, but all of you find ways to continue building each other up. And that's what makes the difference in your narrative. And here's what's crazy. Just by those actions, your level of stress actually reduces. You know, one of the number one stresses in our lives is other people. I'm sure you could all be honest and you said, you know, some days you've thought this, everything is great if we could just have fewer people who are like so, or who are like so. It's, it's tough, you know, dealing with humans is tough. I, I do it for a living because I love the human condition. I love the fact that we can be kings and sages in one moment and we can be idiots and despondents in the next moment. It's kind of comical and awesome to watch that. But we go much deeper. We, we see each other in different ways. And that's what I wanted to figure out. And so in this study that I was doing, I found that people really focused in, I asked them, I said, who is it that, that is your greatest support system? And it turned out that the reason these folks were able to make it through a stressful situation is that they had an amazing support system. And that's what DAI does. You focus on being there for each other and providing a support system. Most people don't think about the value of a support system. And I know that you know, at different points in history, but also in different cultures, there's this idea that if you need help, you are weak. But if we really think about it, when you can ask for help, it's not that you're weak, you're actually wise because the wise know how to ask for help. Because the wise recognize I don't have to do it by myself. It's not that I can't do it by myself. It's just that I don't have to. And you are all living in community and you've set a space for you to all be around each other and support each other and build each other up. They, these people, they have become part of your narrative, right? Um, I love quills. Um, I could have lived during Shakespeare's time. I don't know whether I'd have been able to handle the whole pen thing with a feather, but I love to collect feathers when I'm out walking, jogging, hiking, whatever it is that I'm doing. And so I always have a feather somewhere and I always love to create pens out of them. But every one of you should, when you can find one of these, hopefully you're not plucking it from a bird, but when you can find one of these, keep it as a reminder that there are a lot of people in your life that are helping you write your story. But at the same time, you are doing the same thing in their life. That you are taking this quill, they're passing this quill over to you and you are helping write a chapter in their life, a paragraph in their life, because you're choosing to spend time with people, choosing to support people, choosing to encourage people, whether it's through the text messages you send or message boards and so on. It just, it makes so much of a difference. I can't imagine my story being what it is today without the relationships that I have. I was on a podcast yesterday and that question came up of relationships. Um, they said, well, you know, some of the most recent things you've done, you've mentioned in, you know, in, in your book that it's about, um, you know, relate relationships. I said, well, relationships take time to nurture. They do. And there's a lot of investment that you have to put into relationships, but it's probably the best investment that you could ever make. Uh, my neighbor across the street, she has four kids. Um, she's a divorced mom and she is working, going to school as well. And so, you know, once a month, maybe once every other month, I, t I load the kids in the car and I take them to go get pizza and then load them up with ice cream and then send them back home to their mother right? High on sugar. But I love doing that with them because it gives their mother a break. But also it shows them that they're growing and learning in community. We may not have the same community like I had in Zambia, but this is part of our community. This is our little uh, enclave. And I want them to feel safe and know that there are other adults other than their parents and direct relations who care about them. For me, that's important because so many other people did the same thing for me. You know, when I moved here from Zambia, I was 19 years old, 10,000 miles away from home, the furthest I'd ever been from home for the first time in my life, right? Last of nine kids. 
it was rough, right? Landed in uh, New York City on Valentine's Day, 1997. Thinking like it is in Zambia that I would just get to New York and jump on a flight uh, and come to Houston. And it turned out it doesn't work that way in the US, now I know. And so I did one thing that I will never do ever again. I got on a Greyhound bus from New York City to Houston, Texas. I don't advise that. And that was pre-Wi-Fi, <laughs> so I certainly don't. But there were people on the bus who talked to me, connected with me. Some people got off at different spots, but there were just people who just embraced me. Strangers, total strangers. We just connected, we bonded. And that was just the beginning of my journey. And over the last 20 something years, I've amassed a wonderful group of people who love me, who care for me, who support me, who believe in me, who advise me. Um, I ended up getting uh, an, an extra set of parents who all but legally adopted me and they remain my parents today. My American parents and my Zambian parents have met uh, before and there's a richness to my experience, which means now there's a richness to my narrative. So on the bad days, I know I know where to go, where to where to go to, right? When when on the days when I feel as if I am not I am not enough, on the days when I feel I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not any of those things. I remember all those relationships, and most days those relationships step in without me even having to ask because they want to make sure that I am solid, I am supported, and so on. So. Couple more things, and then I'm going to open it up for for some questions, and then we, we we can continue our process. But there are two things that the relationships in our lives bring to us. Number one, they are a wonderful sounding board, and they are also a safe haven or a safe place. Um, one of the things I'm extremely fond of is uh, lighthouses. Now you have to understand. For a person who really likes lighthouses, but I grew up in Zambia, which is landlocked, so I had I had never seen a I'd never seen one of those until I moved away from home. But one of the things I like about lighthouses is even when the one thing that stays constant and always leads you home is a lighthouse. Power can be out on the island. Power can be out on land but the lighthouse always has a way of bringing people in, whether the seas are rough, whether the seas are good. Those are the relationships that we nurture. All of us need to have at minimum two people in our lives who become that lighthouse for us. And that's what this group of people that I interviewed, that's what they, they each had. They had someone that they could go to and they could bring them in because it's hard. I mean, there's no other way to say it. It is absolutely difficult and it's absolutely hard on the seas of life. No one experiences your life the way you do. No one. There's nobody that experiences your life right now the way you do. And that's part of the loneliness of life. It's really odd. It's the, but when we engage in a deep way with others, that loneliness fades a little bit because we actually see each other, that people see our pain, people see our distress, people see our fear, but at the same time, they see our joy, they see our compassion, they see our great things, they see all of us in all dimensions. That's what I want out of life, is I want every dimension of my life to be seen. It doesn't have to be seen by the whole world. That's the part I'm excited about. The whole world doesn't need to see it. I just need enough people to see it. I can't remember which author it was, but his words were, um, I want my life to be witnessed. So I want certain people in my world to witness my life. You each have somebody in this group right now who is witnessing your life. And I want that for all of my life. On the, in the good days, in the bad days, whether I'm ill, whether I'm well, I want that because that is what truly gives me safety, right? There's two sides of safety in psychology. We talk about felt safety, but we also talk about psychological safety. And I think there's another one, but let's focus on those two. A person can physically be in a self place, in a safe place, but if they don't feel safe, then they don't have self, uh, uh, felt safety. Psychological safety 
is when we know that it is absolutely okay for us to be us because the people around us will still witness who we are in all our splendor, right? With our, you know, as they say, warts and all, they will see all of us and they won't change how they feel about us. That's a major distressor when you can walk into a situation knowing that it doesn't matter what I do, right? Obviously within, you know, wisdom and reason, it doesn't matter what I do. My core group of people, they're not going anywhere, right? They are each a lighthouse and that lighthouse isn't moving because I'm, you know, today I ended up becoming a bad um, captain of my ship. The, it's not moving, it's gonna stay right there. So whether I'm captaining well or I'm captaining poorly, the lighthouse isn't going anywhere. It's going to keep shining and telling me, come home, Koji. And that's what's exciting about having a strong group of people. So here are the three things that came out of my research and I keep finding in anecdotal research from conversations with people just like you uh, and we've had in the past. First, they refuse to quit. And let me bring that home for you. I don't know how to say this other than you don't, you guys don't know how to quit. And I love that. I, we're kindred spirits in that regard. In fact, when people tell me no, or you can't, that's like putting a fire or putting fuel on the fire. I'm like, please tell me I can't, because then I am going to spend all my energy proving to you that I can and that you're wrong. That's each of you, because there's this idea that with the challenge that you're facing, with the disease that you're fighting, you're supposed to just pack it up and go sit in a corner somewhere. That's not what you're doing. You are living life like normal. You're doing everything that you can. You're connecting in a real and genuine way with each other. And I'll say it again, from people in a global setting, people from all over the world engaging with each other. That's what you're doing. You don't know how to quit. So I love that that when people get past challenges, the one thing that they become very self-reflective about is that they don't quit. And that's a huge marker for resiliency. Second, these folks felt as if they grew as leaders. And often we think of leaders as people who are you know, leading large organizations and so on, but no, this is people growing as leaders because we lead in our communities, whether those communities in a setting like this, which is an online global community, or it's leading in a community where you've got kids across the street that feel safe to be around you and want to spend time with you because that's what life is about. It's about that connectedness. And last, people felt as if they were made stronger. So I want you to picture this. I don't have that in here right now, but if I had a, two sets of weights, and I kept using them, most likely my muscles would grow stronger. That's exactly what stress does for you. You take those stressors and you, you do your curls with them, right? You do your over, overhand, overheads with them, right? You do all kinds of things, your body gets stronger. And it's the same way with the stressors and the challenges that come in your life. You allow them to help you grow because that's a choice. And if there's anything that came out of my research is people were making some really hard choices to be better, to do better, to have better. So that's always something I think about, right? The be, do, and have. Do I want to be better? Do I want to do better? Do I want to have better? And if the answer to any of those is yes, then the next logical question is, well, how? How can I do that? And people start to realize that it's in the context of relationship. It's in the context of communication. It's in the context of seeing ourselves exactly like we are and us being comfortable with what we find. That as, as, you know, as great as Koji might think he is today, there's so much room for improvement and he can make that improvement. And that he's got a support system that will hold him accountable. That on the days when he thinks he's not doing as great, but he actually is, they'll call him out and say, you're doing great. On the days when he thinks he's actually doing better than he thinks he is, they'll say, no, 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 no. We need you to stay humble. There's still opportunity for you to grow. And so I had a conversation today with someone in our office and I said, I want us, I said, I never want us to think ourselves smaller than we actually are or bigger 
than we actually are. If we can do that, we will always have impact. So I'm going to share that with you. I never want you to think of yourself as smaller than you are or bigger than you are. And you will find yourself constantly improving, constantly growing, constantly meaningfully touching the people in your world. Because I believe that's why we're on this earth. We're required to touch a certain number of people. I don't know what that number is for you. I don't know what that number is for me. But until my work is done, I will continue touching people because that's what matters most. That's why we're given the gifts that we have. And here's my last thought. Then I want to bring it to some questions and then we will close. I am going to show you something else. Don't freak out. All right. So most human beings don't have an ax in their office. Most human beings. I'm just going to go with that. But this ax here is kind of special. It, it's really, really old. I asked my American dad, I wanted to do a video on um, sharpening your edge and growing. And I said, dad, hey, do you have an old ax? He's like, as a matter of fact, I do. Because my dad, my dad is like a hoarder. Anything that he can potentially fix, he will hold on to it. So he found this one somewhere. But as you can see, it's really, really old, right? It's rusted and it's pretty blunt. I am asking you to do something with your own ax. Honestly, I don't care about the rust. What I care about with this ax is whether it's sharp or not. And I want you to constantly be working on sharpening your edge here because you and I have no idea when life will call us to chop down the next tree in our life. And I want you to do very quick work of it. And you can only do very quick work of it if your edge, this side and this side are sharp. Because if your edge isn't sharp, you can probably still chop down that tree. It'll just take longer. But worse, it'll take more work for you to do that. So if you can, please make that a priority to constantly sharpen your edge, your ability to communicate with others, your ability to communicate your needs, your ability to have honest, genuine, and sincere conversations. That's you working on your edge every single day. And if you need a reminder, then uh, you should find yourself an old ax because that will help you remember. And that's probably one of the reasons I have it in the office is I always want to remember how it's so important to keep sharpening my edge because sometimes I think we look at our, we, we think we've arrived in one way or another, but I want to constantly be a, a lifelong learner to always be thinking about what can I learn next? How can I grow more? Uh, what contributions can I make? Who do I need to touch next? And when we can make that level of contribution, I don't believe there's a single disease or a single pandemic that can take us out. I just don't think so, because that's what makes being human so unique. And those are the contributions we get to make to others.